This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Deb Bacon Ziegler in Lansing, Michigan. The Rosary by Florence L. Barclay. Chapter 14. In Derrick's Safe Control. The white cliffs of Dover gradually became more solid and distinct, until at length they rose from the sea, a strong white wall, emblem of the undeniable purity of England, the stainless honor and integrity of her throne, her church, her parliament, her courts of justice, and her dealings at home and abroad, whether with friend or foe. Strength and whiteness, thought Jane, as she paced the steamer's deck and after a two years' absence her heart went out to her native land. Then Dover Castle caught her eye, so beautiful in the pearly light of that spring afternoon. Her mind leaped to enjoyment, then fell back stunned by the blow of quick remembrance, and Jane shut her eyes. All beautiful sights brought this pang to her heart since the reading of that paragraph on the piazza of the Mena House Hotel. An hour after she had read it, she was driving down the long straight road to Cairo, embarked at Alexandria the next day, landed at Brindisi, and this night and day travelling had brought her at last within sight of the shores of England. In a few minutes she would set foot upon them, and then there would be but two more stages to her journey. For, from the moment she started, Jane never doubted her ultimate destination. The room where pain and darkness and despair must be waging so terrible a conflict against the moral courage, the mental sanity, and the instinctive hold on life of the man she loved. That she was going to him Jane knew, but she felt utterly unable to arrange how or in what way her going could be managed. That it was a complicated problem her common sense told her though her yearning arms and aching bosom cried out, O oh God, is it not simple, blind and alone, my Garth! But she knew an unbiased judgment, steadier than her own, must solve the problem, and that her surest way to Garth lay through the doctor's consulting room. So she telegraphed to Derrick from Paris, and at present her mind saw no further than Wimpole Street. At Dover she bought a paper, and hastily scanned its pages as she walked along the platform in the wake of the capable porter who had taken possession of her rugs and hand-baggage. In the personal column she found the very paragraph she sought. We regret to announce that Mr. Garth Dalmain still lies in a most precarious condition at his house on Deeside, Aberdeenshire, as a result of the shooting accident a fortnight ago. His sight is hopelessly gone, but the injured parts were progressing favorably, and all fear of brain complication seemed over. During the last few days, however, a serious reaction from shock has set in, and it has been considered necessary to summon Sir Derek Brand, the well-known nerve specialist, in consultation with the oculist and the local practitioner in charge of the case. There is a feeling of widespread regret and sympathy in those social and artistic circles where Mr. Dalmain was so well known and so deservedly popular. "'Oh, thank you, my lady,' said the efficient porter when he had ascertained, by a rapid glance into his palm, that Jane's half-crown was not a penny. He had a sick young wife at home, who had been ordered extra nourishment, and just as the rush on board began, he had put up a simple prayer to the Heavenly Father, who knoweth that ye have need of these things, asking that he might catch the eye of a generous traveller. He felt he had indeed been led to this plain, brown-faced, broad-shouldered lady, when he remembered how nearly, after her curt nod from a distance had engaged him, he had responded to the blandishments of a fussy little woman, with many more bags and rugs, and a parrot-cage, who was now doling French coppers out of the window of the next compartment. Seven pence a penny of this stuff ain't much for carrying all that along, I don't think, grumbled his mate. And Jane's young porter experienced the double joy of faith confirmed, and willing service generously rewarded. A telegraph boy walked along the train, saying, 
Honorable Jane Champion at intervals. Jane heard her name, and her arm shot out of the window. Here, my boy, it is for me. She tore it open. It was from the doctor. Welcome home, just back from Scotland. We'll meet you, Charing Cross, and give you all the time you want. Have coffee at Dover. Derek. Jane gave one hard, tearless sob of thankfulness and relief. She had been so lonely. Then she turned to the window. Here, somebody, fetch me a cup of coffee, will you? Coffee was the last thing she wanted, but it never occurred to any one to disobey the doctor, even at a distance. The young porter, who still stood sentry at the door of Jane's compartment, dashed off to the refreshment room, and, just as the train began to move, handed a cup of steaming coffee and a plate of bread and butter in at the window. "'Oh, thank you, my good fellow,' said Jane, putting the plate on the seat while she dived into her pocket. "'Here, you have done very well for me. No, never mind the change. Coffee at a moment's notice should fetch a fancy price. Good-bye.' The train moved on, and the porter stood looking after it with tears in his eyes. Over the first half-crown he had said to himself, "'Milk and new-laid eggs.' Now, as he pocketed the second, he added the other two things mentioned by the parish doctor, soup and jelly, and his heart glowed. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. And Jane, seated in a comfortable corner, choked back the tears of relief which threatened to fall, drank her coffee, and was thereby more revived than she could have thought possible. She also had need of many things not of half-crowns, of those she had plenty, but above all else she needed just now a wise, strong, helpful friend, and Derrick had not failed her. She read his telegram through once more, and smiled. How like him to think of the coffee, and, oh, how like him to be coming to the station! She took off her hat and leaned back against the cushions. She had been travelling night and day, in one feverish whirl of haste, and at last she had brought herself within reach of Derrick's hand and Derrick's safe control. The turmoil of her soul was stilled. A great calm took its place, and Jane dropped quietly off to sleep. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Washed and brushed and greatly refreshed, Jane stood at the window of her compartment as the train steamed into Charing Cross. The doctor was stationed exactly opposite the door when her carriage came to a standstill. Mere chance, and yet to Jane it seemed so like him to have taken up his position precisely at the right spot on that long platform. An enthusiastic lady patient had once said of Derrick Brand, with more accuracy of definition than of grammar, you know, he is always so very just there, and this characteristic of the doctor had made him to many a very present help in time of trouble. He was through the line of porters, and had his hand upon the handle of Jane's door in a moment. Standing at the window, she took one look at the firm, lean face, now alight with welcome, and read in the kind, steadfast eyes of her childhood's friend a perfect sympathy and comprehension. Then she saw behind him her aunt's footman, and her own maid, who had been given a place in the Duchess's household. In another moment she was on the platform, and her hand was in Derrick's. "'That is right, dear,' he said. "'All fit and well, I can see. Now hand over your keys. I suppose you have nothing contraband. I telephoned the Duchess to send some of her people to meet your luggage, and not to expect you herself until dinner-time, as you were taking tea with us. Was that right?' this way. Come outside the barrier. What a rabble! All wanting to break every possible rule and regulation, and each trying to be the first person in the front row. Really the patience and good temper of railway officials should teach the rest of mankind a lesson. The doctor, talking all the time, piloted Jane through the crowd, opened the door of a neat electric broom, helped her in, took his seat beside her, and they glided swiftly out into the strand and turned towards Trafalgar Square. Well, said the doctor, Niagara is a big thing, isn't it? When people say to me, were you not disappointed in Niagara? We were. I feel tempted to wish, for one homicidal moment, that the earth would open her mouth and swallow them up. 
People who can be disappointed in Niagara and talk about it should no longer be allowed to crawl on the face of the earth. And how about the little mother? Isn't she worth knowing? I hope she sent me her love. And New York Harbor, did you ever see anything to equal it as you steam away in the sunset? Jane gave a sudden sob, then turned to him dry-eyed. Is there no hope, Derek? The doctor laid his hand on hers. He will always be blind, dear, but life holds other things besides sight. We must never say no hope. Will he live? There is no reason he should not live, but how far life will be worth living largely depends upon what can be done for him, poor chap, during the next few months. He is more shattered mentally than physically. Jane pulled off her gloves, swallowed suddenly, then gripped the doctor's knee. Derek, I love him. The doctor remained silent for a few moments, as if pondering this tremendous fact. Then he lifted the fine, capable hand resting upon his knee, and kissed it with a beautiful reverence, a gesture expressing the homage of the man to the brave truthfulness of the woman. "'In that case, dear,' he said, "'the future holds in store so great a good for Garth Dalmain that I think he may dispense with sight.' Meanwhile you have much to say to me, and it is, of course, your right to hear every detail of his case that I can give. And here we are at Wimpole Street. Now come into my consulting room. Stoddart has orders that we are on no account to be disturbed. End of chapter 14